Hello everyone, and thanks for coming so early. I mean, come on, it's 9.30, and it's minus one degrees outside, so I understand how difficult it was. Um, today we're going to talk about getting started with Ethereum Solidity development, so I hope that's what you're here for, because, well, otherwise. And just previously on DevOps, so we were here last year to talk about, guess what, blockchain development and Ethereum but mostly to talk about why you should get interested in the blockchain. So we won't go over that again. Uh, if you want to watch the detailed three-hour presentation, you can go to YouTube and see the presentation for yourself. But we still want to give a brief introduction for those who were not here last year, and just as a way that everybody starts with the same point and understands what we're talking about. One of the main feedbacks that we got last year is that we our presentation was very broad and lacked some code and after all we are in a developer conference so fear not this year there will be plenty of code to draw on but we dive right into it who was here last year at our presentation okay about 10 i'd say who is here because they want to get into this world and get rich fast with ICOs and stuff. Ah, still a few, okay, okay. Uh, just a word of warning, we're not gonna talk about cryptocurrencies here. I mean, not for the sake of it, but really focus on development. Who has already written some Solidity code and can understand what this does? Couple, three, four, okay. And who is one of our Udemy students? Nobody, that's good. Because if you were, you would be able to enjoy this amazing course that we have. Okay, whatever. Um, so who we are, very briefly. Uh, we are all-time freelance developers. We've worked on all sorts of projects, from back-end to mobile to front-end, web, smartwatches, smart TVs, fridges, whatnot. Um, one, two. Together, we own a fortune of about five ethers, so we're pretty rich. I mean, come on. Uh, I mean, not now, maybe ne next year. And uh, yeah, two months ago, we released a course on Udemy. We have more than a thousand students about Ethereum development. I don't know what I'm mentioning. Anyway, uh, so what are we going to talk about today? First of all, I'm going to give you a short introduction to blockchain architecture, <coughs> how it works, what it um, includes, and so on. And then uh, we are going to create a DAP, a decentralized application, from scratch with Truffle. You will see what Truffle is later on. Uh, we will write a smart contract. We will see how to test smart contracts, how to interact with them once they are deployed, how to create a front end very briefly. And then, did I mention we have an online course on Udemy? Sorry. No. Uh, so. Very brief introduction to the blockchain. There are a few things that blockchains are awesome at. The first thing, it's not just for fintech. So I'm sure you've heard of, a, of the blockchain in the world of banks and insurance companies and so on. It's clearly not the only uh, vertical, I would say, where they are useful. And I would even argue that it's not the best one because those industries are highly centralized and we're talking about a technology that was designed to be decentralized. So be aware of this uh, limitation. What they're awesome at is robustness. They were designed to work decentralized and distributed because, well, the same as the way the web was designed first, if you remove a node, it still works. If you remove half of the node, it still works. So it's really made for those kinds of applications where you need to be sure that the system will run no matter what. Another thing it's great at is censorship resistance. Uh, I've sh I'm sure you've heard since uh, the invention of Bitcoin, well, one day it will disappear. A nation state will take it and shut it down. Not possible. They would have liked to. After all, it is an alternate currency. And by most nation states' laws, you're not allowed to create a an alternate currency. But still, they can't take it down because... It's censorship resistant by design. Another thing it's great at is being completely borderless. There is no notion of a national border on a blockchain, none whatsoever. So it's really powerful for those kinds of applications where you need to transfer value and do stuff uh, on a global scale. 
Another thing it's great at is being secure, but that's why I chose this image, secure in a very slow way, okay? You trade off sl uh, security for speed, basically. Uh, at least that's the case for now, but don't believe those who would say that's, this, that's the, the way things are in the blockchain world. I mean, we are talking about a technology that's still very early, very young, and it's evolving very fast, so most of these problems will be solved at some point. So basically, it's great for disintermediating markets. That's the main thing. So whenever you have an industry that's uh, run by a category of actors or yeah, um, a, a type of companies whose main job is to serve as a, a trust party or an intermediary, that's the thing where you can rethink the business model based on the blockchain. And that's what scares the shit out of banks, basically, because, well, again, they are intermediaries and their main business is to take a cut of everything. But that's not the only one. Notaries, insurance companies, uh, I said it's not just for fintech, it's also for in the energy market, uh, in plenty of uh, industries, really. And basically, what it allows you to do is to create a network of value. So you might already understand that the internet is designed as a network of information, which means that when I send something, I keep, I keep a copy of it, so everything works by replication. But on the blockchain, it works by copy. So when I send you something, I don't have it anymore. And that's absolutely key. That's something that we couldn't do before and that we can do now, thanks to the way the blockchain is designed. And yes, it's also very good at looking hype. So this is just the progression of the price of a share of a company. And the last uh, part of the graph is the day they decided to add blockchain to their name. So yeah, of course, there's that also. But what I would like you to remember after this talk is that it's also very important in terms of opportunities for you guys, developers, OK? I know we're all excited by the last JavaScript framework and, uh, and the latest uh, evolutions in Spring and so on. But here we're talking about a technology, and I'm, I mark my words, I'm talking about a technology that's going to be the foundation of businesses for the 20 years to come. It's not ready for, completely ready for prime time yet, but this is it. This is going to decentralize so many industries and it's going to go beyond businesses. So I hope you all realize the importance of that moment the role that you may have to play in this transition, and yeah, the incredible world that's uh, before us. So how do blockchain achieve what we just talked about? First, by building a distributed ledger. So ledgers are a very efficient way to, um, to manage value, uh, whether in a real world with paper ledgers or in the existing world. That's the way banks manage their backends, basically. And the difference with the blockchain is that this ledger, instead of being stored in one central database, is distributed across the network. So every single node in the network has a full copy of the entire database. Okay, so that's the main key. And what, when you hear blockchain, that's what it is. It's a chain of blocks where each block contains a list of transactions. So when you chain blocks together, you in indeed have a global ledger of all the transactions. The way it does it is through decentralized consensus. Now, this is something that we talked about last year, but it's really, really important to understand. This is a problem that's been bugging, the, that had been bugging the, the computer science community for you know, since, since the 90s, basically, and it's called the Byzantine General's Problem. Okay, so again, imagine a city that's surrounded by armies, each army is led by a general, and they all have to decide independently whether they want to attack or if they want to go home. If they all attack at the same time, the city will be taken and the armies will be victorious. If they all go home, then nobody is harmed, the city remains intact and everybody is happy. Now, if some of them decide to attack and the others go home, then we have a problem. It's going to be a massacre. Not just for those who attack and get butchered, but also for those who get home and will have to pay the price. And this happens in a context where the communication between generals is very unreliable. Okay, let's say they're talking via horse messengers, for example, and messengers can get co uh, corrupted, they can lie, they can get intercepted, replaced, whatever. 
So you can see the analogy here. This is exactly the situation that we were in. We have to agree on a common version of that distributed ledger, okay, to all work on the same version of the truth. But we have to do it on a network that's highly unreliable. It's called the internet. And, uh, and we all have to come to an agreement. Okay, so that's decentralized consensus thing. And again, there is no super general that arbitrates the decision in the end. Another thing is that it does that over a peer-to-peer -peer network, which means that at any point, nine nodes can join or leave the network without any words of warning. Okay, and this is absolutely key because this kind of problems, the Byzantine general problems, we already had solved it in the 2000s. Uh, before Bitcoin, but in a very specific context where the network size was always the same and the nodes were known and so on. And all of that ha happens in a trustless community of anonymous nodes. So you don't need to authenticate nodes before they join the network. There are mechanisms in place to make sure that all those nodes behave in a, in a consistent way. And you don't need to trust the nodes themselves. Trust is built into the network. That's a key difference. And all those nodes are here to contribute timestamped, tamper-proof, and immutable transactions. And again, in, in the case of Bitcoin, those transactions are money transfers, but we'll see that on a more generic blockchains, those transactions can be much more powerful and include any kind of value. And for any kind of network of value, you need your transactions to be immutable. You don't want people to be able to change history. Uh, you need them to be tamper-proof, so whenever they are sent across the network, we have a way to verify that nobody fiddled with them, and they are timestamped, so everything keeps, uh, I mean, remains in order. And thanks to all that, we can transfer any kind of value, as I said, not just cryptocurrency, but really any kind of value that we can uh, represent. And again, remember that the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, was designed as a way to create. A monetary system and to transfer currency. That's already a pretty nice achievement. But uh, what we have now with Ethereum is the ability to do much more than that. So concretely, how do you use a blockchain? Well, first of all, you need to install a network client. Okay, there is no server to connect to or whatever. You just install this application on your computer and you start it. When you start it, it connects to the network. So it finds a few peers around you and it starts to download a copy of the distributed ledger. And that's something that it needs in order to start uh, secure transactions. So this can take a little bit of time. Okay? Right now, when you, when you start a new node from scratch, it takes about two to three hours to download the entire Ethereum blockchain. Uh, the goal to de for the developers is to bring it down to under 10 minutes, but still, that's, a, that's something that you need. Uh, un um, I mean, at least if you want to start a full node. The next thing you have to do is to create an account, which on a blockchain is pretty simply a key pair. So a private key and a public key. Your public key helps you identify your account. Your private key, you keep it to yourself because that's the way you sign transactions. And if you lose your private key, if, you, if somebody gets a hold of it, you're screwed. So keep that very, um, very securely. Of course, creating such an account, a key pair, is completely free. So you can do it uh, as many times as you want, and nobody will uh, require you to send you a copy of your identity card. Then to use the network, you will need some cryptocurrency. In the case of Ethereum, that's Ether. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, that's Bitcoin, of course. And every open blockchain has its own uh, intrinsic cryptocurrency. And you can do that very simply by going to something like Coinbase, any marketplace where you can buy some cryptocurrency with your credit card or sending a wire transfer. It's very easy now. Of course, you can also, uh, instead of buying some cryptocurrency, you can also mine it. But that requires a kind of a bigger investment. And then, again, if you buy some cryptocurrency on those marketplaces, don't forget to... Uh, transfer it somewhere safe, because those, those marketplaces are not what we can call safe. They are a centralized database where they store uh, your, the private key for your account. So if somebody gets to hack these, well, it happened in the past, and that's where all the thefts happened. 
It was never uh, a known bug in the blockchain itself. It was all the in the marketplaces that shit happens. That's the weak link in the network, really. And once you have some cryptocurrency, then you can start using it to deploy your smart contract. And we'll actually show you uh, how to do that. And then you can call functions on smart contracts. So you can see smart contracts like, uh, I'm going to use a buzzword, uh, like microservices, okay, that you deploy somewhere. And then it, there's an API and you can call functions on it. When you deploy a contract to the blockchain, it doesn't do anything. It's just sitting there as a, as a service with a state, so with a, a persistence uh, a database of sorts. And then you can call functions on it to modify that data and to get data. So what happens behind the scenes? This is a typical example of a transaction. So you send a transaction from an account. You send it to another account, which can be either uh, another human account, I would say, if I want to transfer money. In this case, it's a contract account. So uh, the nonce is just a way to avoid replay attacks. So it's a kind of a counter if you want. The gas price and the gas limits, this is very important because that's a way for uh, that's a way to pay for the execution of the functions that you're calling. So yes, nothing is free on a blockchain. Now, of course, as we said before, the, this price is very, very little. Uh, for a simple transfer, I think now it's under one cent of a dollar. Uh, and then, of course, it depends on the complexity of your, of your network, uh, sorry, of your uh, functions. Uh, and that's the way that, network, that the blockchain network uh, prevents people from abusing and uh, overusing the capacity of the network, if you want. Then you can, with every transaction, you can associate value. Again, not just for money transfers, but also if you call a function on a, on a contract, you can also associate value uh, to, that, uh, to that call. And in that case, it's important to understand that every contract has its own balance. So you are effectively sending money to a contract. And then inside the contract, you can send money away. And the data field is to include, for example, the name of the function you want to call, the parameters, and so on. And of course, everything is, uh, is encoded there. So once you have created your transaction, you sign it with your private key, and it spreads over the entire network. Starts with your peers, and then the, your, your peers send it to their peers, and so on. And very fast, it spreads over the entire network using uh, what we call a gossip protocol. Uh, it's called the dev P2P protocol, and I won't go into details here, but you can find uh, this information on the, the Ethereum wiki. Then miners, who are just other users of the, on the network with a little uh, option enabled in their client, they can pick up your transaction and try to mine it into a block. Again, we won't go over the consensus algorithm, the mining stuff uh, in here, but I strongly advise you to have a look at this uh, address where they really show you how mining works and you can really see those transactions work and it's all very simple. There's a video on YouTube and there's also the, the prototype that you can try online. So miners pick up your transaction and mine it into a block and then blocks get built and append into the chain, at, re at which point they can spread across the network again. And this stats tool is just a way for you to see the actual live blockchain work and see the blocks being added by, by I mean, who are the miners who uh, appended the block and so on. When a node receives a new block, you can easily check it. And that's what the node software does it, uh, does behind the scenes without you even noticing. And we can check a few cryptographic primitives and then we're sure that the block is authentic and it was really pr uh, processed via mining. And again, you can use etherchain.org or anything to actually inspect the blocks, see what's inside, when it was produced, by whom, and so on. And you rinse and repeat every few minutes. So on the blockchain, on the Bitcoin blockchain, it's every 10 minutes. On Ethereum, it's about every 15 seconds now, I think. Uh, and this process goes on and on. Before we dive into the real blockchain, again, we just want to emphasize a few things that blockchains are not very good at. So if you want to run a blockchain on a small device, think again, because the, of course, as we said, every transaction is appended to, the, to the, the distributed ledger that everybody has a copy of. So it grows and grows and grows. Okay? Uh, 
these are approximate figures. Uh, but for Bitcoin, for example, right now the blockchain is about 140 gigs and it grows by 4 gigs a month. For Ethereum, it's about 70 gigs. I say about because actually in, in the Ethereum case, it's a little bit more complicated to calculate. It all depends on the mode that you choose to synchronize and so on. So I won't go into details with that, but it's about that uh, order of magnitude. Another thing that blockchains are not very good at is throughput. We said it before, uh, if you compare, for example, the Bitcoin and the Ethereum blockchains compared to traditional centralized networks, uh, Bitcoin is about 11 transactions per second now. Uh, Ethereum is about 20. Uh, but, and that's a max. That's a cap. Okay? It cannot be, go beyond. For PayPal, it's about 115, but that's an average. It's not a cap. Visa, about 2,000 transactions per second, but they can, they can go up to 40, 50, 60,000 uh, transactions per second especially when it's uh, holidays and everybody is buying like crazy. So that's also something to remember. Again, we pay uh, the decentralization aspect with uh, a little bit of uh, uh, speed. Another thing, real time. So uh, when you send a transaction to a network, it has to spread across it, be mined into a block. The block has to be uh, spread again across the network. So all of that takes time. And uh, when you send typ a typical uh, trans um, call to a REST API, for example, uh, it can take a few hundred milliseconds. But when you send a transaction on Bitcoin, you have to wait for at least six blocks to be sure that the transaction is an absolutely uh, immutable. And uh, that's about an hour. For Ethereum, it's much shorter. As I said, blocks are produced every 15 seconds or so. And you have to wait, uh, well, it was 17 seconds last year. And uh, you have to wait 12 blocks to have absolute confirmation of your transaction. So that's also something to remember. And another thing is that uh, blockchains were designed to work in big networks with a lot of nodes. So when you try to apply it in small networks, well, you get centralization again and you get plenty of issues, okay? So it works great in gr uh, big networks, a few thousand nodes or something, uh, but as soon as you try to apply it to a smaller context, well, it's clearly not efficient enough. And it has a problem with privacy. That's something, again, that's gonna change in the near future, but for now, clearly storing your medical records on the Ethereum blockchain might not be the best idea either. Okay, so keep that in mind. Everybody has a copy of all the data. It's not like it's, uh, I mean, everybody can see it right away. They still need to decode it and so on. But I mean, if the information is precious enough, it will happen. And as we said before, it's not good at free usage. So every single transaction that modifies the state of the blockchain, that changes something in the database, has to pay a price. And this price, in the case of Ethereum, is called gas, okay? Uh, it's not directly paid in Ether, but basically uh, it's, a, it's a unit of, of complexity. Uh, the more your code is complex, the more gas units it will require to run. And then each gas unit has a price in Ether. Okay, so when you send a transaction to the network, especially when you call a function, uh, 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 an Ether transfer, so just sending cryptocurrency across to another account is about 21,000 gas. Uh, but when you want to run more complex code, then it, it's the, uh, it has a price. And of course, the heavier the, the, the operation you're trying to run, uh, the more it costs. And you can find plenty of information about that on this website. And it's not very good as, at fast protocol upgrades. You've certainly heard of forks, soft forks, hard forks, whatever. Uh, those are the ways that we change the way the consensus works and the way the network works. When you, de when you deploy a centralized application on a server somewhere, you just change the application, you upload a new version, and nobody saw everything, anything. On this kind of networks where the software runs literally on every single node, then you have to upgrade that software on the whole network. And that takes time. And sometimes it doesn't happen very, very well. Sometimes some of the nodes decide to upgrade and others say, no, I'm staying with the old version. And then problems start to appear. So if you want to understand more about what a, uh, a fork is, there was one on Ethereum two, yeah, two or three weeks ago, and it went well. Everybody uh, agreed with it, so everything uh, went smoothly. But we explain everything in this uh, video. And the 
Next thing that uh, blockchains are not very good at is pleasing centralized institutions and regulators. So you might have seen this news of this guy at uh, JP Morgan that says, yeah, but the Bitcoin is a scam and it's going to disappear. Yeah, it's a scam for you because it doesn't fit into your world. But we're in a different world now. You don't know it yet, but it's different. So that's something also to keep in mind. You will have some resistance from either big companies, even nation states, governments, and so on, uh, because this is a completely new paradigm for them. The last thing I want to insist on before we dive into some code uh, is what you should not call a blockchain. And again, if you've seen my talk last year, uh, our talk last year, you saw that I'm kind of obsessive with that, but I think it's very important to balance the message and inform everyone on what a blockchain really is, because you might sometimes hear of this thing called permission blockchains. And notice the number of quotes around blockchains. For us, and for a lot of people actually in the blockchain community, permission blockchains are like planes on highways. Imagine if the Wright brothers came with the airplane and they said, yeah, it's, it, it flies, and they say, it flies fast, but it flies. And then people said, hey, this is cool at being fast, let's drive it on the highway. No, no, it was designed to fly. Don't care, don't need to fly, I invested in roads, come on, let's, okay. And that's what most companies are doing when they're using these permission blockchains. They're taking an amazing technology that was designed for a, a, com a very complex um, and, and yeah, very new uh, landscape, basically, and they remove the part they don't agree with and they try to do something with it. But then what they end up with is actually over, overly complex solutions to existing problems. Yes, banks have a problem to be efficient and to make our uh, wire transfers more fast, for example. Yeah, sure. But is the blockchain really the best solution? If you start with the same assumptions and so on, can't you find an easier solution than this? Okay, there's no buzzword and so on, and your share doesn't go through the roof just because you added blockchain to your name. But still, from an arch architectural standpoint, it doesn't make a sense. So for us, those permission blockchains are a huge diversion of money and energy when we would need definitely to have more brains and more people thinking about open blockchains and how to solve the last problems that we have. So, yeah, that's the problem. And don't forget, there's a, a, a side effect to that. It's not like, okay, let them call it blockchain and they'll come back afterwards. There's a risk for open blockchains as well. You know this Gartner innovation cycle? There's a through of disillusionment at some point. Well, that's when uh, those big companies will say, yeah, it doesn't work. That's because of the blockchain. Remember, they did exactly the same for Agile. They did this, exactly the same thing for the cloud. Okay, when it doesn't work, it's because of the technology, it's not because of their decisions. So, mark my words. So, as you guessed, today we'll be talking about open blockchains and more specifically about Ethereum. And we're going to show you what is a DAP. So, a DAP is a decentralized application. And very basically, it's a set of smart contracts. And again, we'll show you what it is with a user interface. So, you have smart contracts that are deployed to the blockchain, and when they are deployed to the blockchain, they get an address, okay? That's a fixed address that you can use to, uh, to access them. Those contracts can collaborate together, okay? And they all expose some API that you can use to call them. And usually you call them from a UI because, yeah, calling smart contracts directly is like calling a REST, a REST API directly. It's not the most user-friendly way. I mean, for normal people. I guess you all use Po all day and stuff. Maybe that, that's not for real people. Anyway, and you do all that, you use all that in a special kind of browser. Why is it special? Because it needs some keys to work. It needs to send, to sign some transactions for the network, and it does that with a, a bunch of key pairs that are stored in the browser. And of course, this browser needs to be connected somehow to the network, in order, in order to spread new transactions, to get new blocks, and so on. Okay, so that's what we're going to show you. Now, let's get our hands dirty. Let's say we want to organize a new conference. Okay? And it will be a conference where attendees can register using cryptocurrencies instead of paying with euros and dollars and stuff. That's so boring. And uh, they can also vote for talks that they attend. Nothing fancy here. 
But the difference is that in this conference, speakers will be paid according to their reviews, according to the, the, the ratings that they get from attendees, proportionally, if you want. Now, let's call it, let's say, decentralized, vo yeah, let's call it DVOX. Do you think we'll have a problem? No. <laughs> anyway. So that's going to be the name of the app we are going to show you today. A few disclaimers. Uh, this is completely original code. So we, of course, we demonstrate uh, another application in our online course, but this is a completely new one. And uh, it's the first time we show it. So there might be some quirks here and there, but uh, bear with us. Usual warning, this is by no means usable in production, so if you want to organize your own conference, you might have to work a little bit more than what we did. Uh, this is really to show you how it works, generally. Uh, we are going to live code some of it, uh, review most of it. The goal is not to, for you to watch us, to look at us type for three hours, but still, uh, we're going to show you some real code and show you how it integrates in the application uh, progressively. And of course, we'll, everything is already on a GitHub repo that will give you the address at the end so you can check out the, the entire project afterwards to see how it works. And uh, we'll focus on smart contracts first, uh, and then at the end we'll show you a bit of web user interface to show you how to uh, finish, I would say, the architecture of this step. So what will the development environment look like? First of all, we're going to use Test RPC. It's a common line tool that is actually an Ethereum node emulator. Okay? So when you're developing, you don't want to develop with the real network where you have to pay real money to run your contracts and so on. And also you don't, have to, uh, to, you don't want to wait real time for it to happen. So uh, on test RPC, everything is instantaneous. It's completely fake. Everything happens in memory. Uh, mining is instantaneous uh, and transactions are basically free. So that's very good for uh, development. Just a, a word of warning, this tool, uh, TestRPC, has been used for, yeah, I think, a year and a half and so on uh, by a lot of people. We are going to show you the Truffle build uh, framework also. Uh, and in the new version that was just released last week, uh, TestRPC is actually integrated into Truffle. So you don't need to start it on the site anymore. But, okay, we adapted our, our content and we wait for the documentation of Truffle to be complete. Um, with Truffle, we'll use it to create the project, to compile contracts, to deploy contracts to the network, and to test also our contracts. And we'll use, I mean, we are using IntelliJ because we are all-time Java developers and we love it, but uh, you can use any text editor with some sort of a Solidity plugin uh, for uh, syntax coloring and stuff. It works really great. Most of those tools, I mean, work with a simple text editor and a, and a terminal anyway. And I think it's coding time. Uh, and this, yeah, it's coding time. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Saeed, who's going to show you how to create the project and get started. OK, let's go. Let's dive to the, to the code. Enough with slides. So as uh, we saw, we need to set up an environment before uh, creating our uh, our DAP, our decentralized application. And the first thing that we have to, to install is uh, an Ethereum node. So as uh, Sebastian told you, uh, we'll use TestRPC because it's fast. And uh, you know, when we develop an application, we hate to wait. So uh, to install TestRPC, it's quite easy. It's uh, Test RPC, it's a Node.js implementation, and you can find it on, on GitHub, uh, this address, github.com, Ethereum, GS, Test RPC. The installation is quite uh, easy. NPM, Node Packet Manager, install MineG to install it globally. Ethereum, GS, dash, Test RPC. Uh, well, we are not going to show you how to install Node.js. I think that, guys, that uh, you are developers, and I'm sure that you are able to, to do it uh, on your own. So to install TestRPC, npm, not in our case, uh, here, npm install, managing, ethereum, js, dash, testrpc. 
Hello. So uh, I will install it. And the installation is quite fast. It has been optimized since a few months uh, now. Yeah, now it, it uses only JavaScript libraries and dependencies, so yeah. it's pretty fast. OK, it's already installed. If I want to start it, test RPC. And here, we can see a lot of things. First, the version of test RPC, version 6.0.1. It's really important with the Ethereum or with any early technology to check the version because sometimes you have some, you know, some upgrades, some minor fixes or some major fixes. And um, when you are working with the, the, the Ethereum blockchain, um, some ma major changes can, can break some some things in your in your smart contract, so you you have to be really careful and to to be sure that the new version will not break anything on your on your code. A anything, so, nothing new for so for people working in a JavaScript environment anyway. Yeah, exactly. Breaking changes in minor versions. Yeah. Duh. So test RPC is powered by a, a, a library called Ganache Core. So uh, Ganache Core now is uh, bundled with uh, within Truffle dot four dot zero. So uh, with Truffle 4.0 that, um, um, that has been released the last week, um, you will not have to start test RPC. But right now, well, just, just, we'll just, just use this version. Test RPC, so it's a, a test Ethereum node. It's creating for you 10 uh, accounts, 10 test accounts. You can see here their public address. Uh, and their private keys. The private keys will be really useful if you have to import the account in a third party application, for example, MetaMask, that will be illustrated at the end of this, uh, of this session. And um, Test RPC is also um, creating 100 Ether for each of these accounts. But don't try to sell these accounts on the main network, it will not work. Okay? It's, mon it's monkey money. Exactly. So test RPC check. Now we have to we need to have a framework to create to compile uh, our smart contracts, but also to, to deploy it to to this uh, to this, this uh, Ethereum node. So we say that uh, we will use a Truffle as a, a development framework. Um, as you can imagine, there are many frameworks, but we, we think that the Truffle is really a, a great solution. This solution has been uh, created by a consensus, uh, the company beyond uh, Truffle and beyond a lot of tools that are used in the, in the Ethereum uh, uh, ecosystem. And um, we think that Truffle is really great, and it's, it's a solution that is, um, I would say, improving uh, um, yeah, very, very fast. Very, very fast. The version Truffle 4.0 is really uh, promising. But here, fr from now, we'll use the, the previous version because we know that this version is really stable. The documentation is up to date. And, um, well, it's a demo. We don't want to... To take risks. Yeah, exactly. So, the, 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 yeah, tr Truffle 4 is, has been released, but documentation not yet. Yeah. Good practice, right? Uh, anyway, so we'll have to wait a few more weeks to get up-to-date documentation on that side. And it's really important because they added quite a few things. So, um, yeah. So to install Truffle, same thing. You have a page here describing the framework. As you can see, you can uh, you can compile smart contract, uh, deploy, deploy it's them. It's basically like Gradle or Maven, yeah, uh, but for thing. dApps. To install it, npm, node packet manager, install, you install it globally, truffle. But here, don't use this command because it will, it will install for you the last version. So we'll use, we'll install the previous version. Uh, the command is npm uh, install minus g truffle. And we'll use the version 3.4.11. Don't do it here. Okay. And here also yeah. the installation is fast. Okay, so Truffle is installed. If you want to check what you are using here, Truffle version. 
And here we have two information that is really important. First, the version of the framework, but also here the version Solidity version 0415. And Solidity is the programming language that we will use to create the, the, the smart contract. So we have several programming languages. I think that it's Viper. Well, there, 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 was, there were already a couple of programming languages at the beginning that completely were uh, thrown away, like Serpent, if you might have seen something like that. Now the main language that's being used is Solidity. Uh, the new one is called Viper. It's not really ready for prime time yet, but uh, it's going to be soon. And uh, there's another one called Bamboo. So basically, you're in known territory here because it's uh, it's the same logic as uh, with the JVM. The uh, the Ethereum network works works with the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. So it's just bytecode, and then you can use any kind of programming language that compiles down into this bytecode to work. So Solidity, Solidity is probably the, the most popular one. Really, exactly. And you can find the, the documentation of Solidity in this uh, URL, solidity.read read the docs.io, yeah, and develop. But uh, again, here, the version of Solidity that is provided in this page is the last version. Uh, you can uh, read the documentation that is related to your environment by you know switching here the version. 0.4.15, and you will have all the documentation related to your version. And unlike some of an environment you might know, new versions of the language don't, hap don't happen only every three years or four years. <clears throat> it's more like every two months. So yeah, you have to keep track of that as well. OK, so now we have the framework. We can uh, create, compile, and deploy the, the, the smart contract. We can also test it. We have a. Uh, an Ethereum node implementation with test RPC that will uh, create a, a blockchain in in-memory blockchain. This is why test RPC is quite fast. Um, but we have to edit the code, uh, of course. So you can use uh, uh, the, the, the editor that you love, for example, Notepad or Vim or whatever. But uh, of Atomos course, Atomos also has an interesting yeah. Yeah, but. We can see in the ecosystem a lot of people using Atom as a, as a, an IDE. As the text editor from GitHub. Yeah. And um, if you want to, uh, to beautify your code, uh, your Solidity code, you will have to install a, a package uh, in Atom. And this package is called, I don't remember the name, yeah. It's a... Uh, in, so an um, language dash Ethereum. It will install for you a plugin that will beautify your Solidity code. Uh, and if you use uh, IntelliJ um, as, as an IDE, as your IDE, you can install a plugin that is uh, maintained by the community that is called uh, go to the plugin, plugin here. Solidity, it's called IntelliJ Solidity. IntelliJ Solidity. <laughs> and this plugin is quite interesting because, uh, of course, you have all, all, the, all the things beautify. Uh, you can also, you have the, the, the auto completion that is quite interesting. But of course, you can uh, use the power of IntelliJ to navigate th uh, between your. Spoiler your, alert, you're showing your, the full contract. Sorry? Spoiler alert, you're oh, showing yeah. the full contract. <laughs> okay, you didn't see anything. Okay, so now we have the environment. We are ready to create uh, our project, our DevOps uh, project. I don't know if, uh, do we, are we allowed to, to use this name? So. Ask for forgiveness, not for, okay. not for permission. So first, I have to create a folder, of course. Call it DevOps. And then uh, I have to create a structure for, for my contract. Hopefully, Truffle is providing um, a kind of boilerplate for you, a kind of starter project that you, that you, are, that you can use to, to, to create your DAP. Um, if, you if, you uh, if you just want to create a smart contract w w without any kind of front-end application, you can use the command Truffle init. Shuffle init will create a project structure, but just to 
just for your smart contract. But here, of course, the plan is to create a real DAP with the backend part and the frontend part. The backend part will, will be your smart contract. The frontend part will be your the 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 web application that will be used by your your users. And there you can use any. I mean, any. No, you can use some of the front-end frameworks you're, you're used to, uh, be it React or Angular or Vue.js or whatever. Well, some of them are clearly more used than others, but uh, yeah, there are uh, uh, boxes because that's the feature that's going to be used uh, for all those uh, different frameworks. So here I'm going to use a simple box. And this box is called PetShop. So it's a. Uh, I'm sure you've read that or used that somewhere. The pet shop application. The wow. pet shop application. It's a it's a jQuery uh, based application. So to create the starter program, I type truffle unbox pet shop. So here it's creating the structure. It's uh, also setting up the npm environment. So it's downloading all the dependencies, and you know how npm gets. It downloads the internet. So, yeah, it's just to show you the process, but... Uh, so I'm going to truffle, framework, boxes. And as we say, uh, there are plenty of boxes available for you. A box for React, a box integrating all the authentication mechanism, a box, a box uh, with a React and U port that is... Um, it's, a, it's kind of an SSO for the blockchain, if you want. Yeah. The patch of the ones that you are going to use, a box that will uh, allow you to create ERC20 token. You know, the, if you want to launch an ICO, so this is uh, the thing that you can use. Um, the web pack, and you have some contribution here for status, for uh, Angular, for and for Vue, for, uh, for I don't know uh, yeah, what we have, stuff, a, lot, so. a lot, a lot of stuff. But if you are brave, you can create your own box. By using this blueprint and to propose Share it, it with to, the community, yeah. to truffle. Okay, so here the project is created. Okay, we can open it on here. Okay, I will close all this thing and then open. And that's why we like also to work with IntelliJ because the support for those front end frameworks is really good, so you can work with your smart contracts and your front-end in the same environment. Of course, you can do that also with Atom and so on, but when you're used to, uh, to IntelliJ, uh, well, it's always better. So before starting coding, we have to analyze the folders that have been creating for, for us. Shuffle is creating this, these folders, the contract folders, migration, node modules, SRC, test, and uh, some some files. So contracts will be the folder that will hold uh, your smart contracts. And you can see here that uh, Truffle has created the, the first contract called migrations. So migration will be used by, by the deployment uh, mechanism of Truffle to know exactly which contract still needs to be deployed on the blockchain. So it's something that is really related to, to Truffle. And migration will hold the the configuration file that will be used to deploy your smart contract when when this smart contract will be uh, compiled, this file will be used to deploy the the the, the contract the bytecode to to the to the, the Ethereum node. So non modules. So the yes. deployment scripts basically. So that's where you specify which contract should be deployed in what order, and some uh, you can configure uh, how you deploy them and so on. Non-modules, so it's a Node.js uh, thing. It stores all the, the dependencies that are required by your environment. SRC will contain all the files that uh, that will be required by your front-end application. So the CSS, the font images, JavaScript. This is where you will you will store your business logic. The HTML file. The, so the pets.json. It's something that was provided with the pet shop sim sample application. And here, uh, an interesting folder test. This is where you will create and install your test suite to, to test your application. It will be um, uh, illustrated uh, by Sebastian in a few minutes. 
And uh, we have here uh, a file called bsconfig.json. This is because a pet shop uh, is using a light server and light server comes also with a browser sync. So it's um, a library that will optimize uh, the run of your uh, web application. Uh, we have the package.json uh, where you will put your dependencies and also to have some comments. For example, npm run dev will start here. Um, the, the light server and uh, and this file is also interesting it's really important for truffle it's the truffle.js so truffle.js will be used by truffle to to um, locate the target environment where to deploy your smart contract so uh, here uh, the file is empty but we will have to to fill it in a few moments so that's it for the um, the the explanation of, of these folders, but uh, now we have to create the smart contract and we'll call it conference. So we create a new file on the contract folders, uh, call it conference.sol. Sol is the file extension for Solidity. And then that's it. Let's start writing we have here to uh, define a keyword pragma uh, and I think uh, yeah, solidity we have here um, a version hmm, 0 0.4.15 okay and instead of typing here class we'll type contract and the name of the contract, conference. So here, the, the Pragma directive, it just used uh, to um, ensure that the smart contract will be compiled with um, uh, a compilator will, 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 with, that will, will not break a, a, any rules on, on your contract. For example, here, the compiler that is below the version of 0 0.4.15 of the Solidity will not be accepted. And all version of the Solidity compiler uh, starting from the version 0.5 will not be accepted too. This, this is done to ensure that uh, your smart contract uh, well, will still work and will still be able to be compiled. Uh, so here I have uh, a contract called conference. Now I have to create the state variables that will hold my, my data. Um, so the state variable will be the contract state. And uh, here I have... Uh, uh, yeah, this one. So the conference will have to store some information um, to identify a talk. And this is what we are going to do here. Uh, so we will create the DevOps app in an iterative approach. So the first step will have to store a talk and to read the details of the talk. Uh, the talk will be identified by a name, a title, sorry, a location, a title, for example, this uh, talk one, a location, room four, a start time and an end time that will be a uh, um, coded in a um, Unix style, uh, it will be uh, um, yeah, compatible with uh, Unix timestamps, the number of seconds since January 1st, uh, 1970. And uh, we will have one speaker per talk. And the speaker will be identified by its address and a name, a full name. Here you can see that uh, in Solidity, we have uh, the, the data tab address that uh, that is a, a twenty byte value um, a twenty byte value used to 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 identify the the public uh, address of of the accounts and here you can see that it's quite similar to any any other uh, uh, programming language just, just uh, precision you might hear us uh, talk about addresses and public keys uh, interchangeably that's because they are basically based on the same information the address is a hash of the public key. So it's a shorter version, I would say, of the public key. So we have strings, you, you, you int, unsigned int, and of course Solidity is providing uh, other kind of data types. 
So we need here to add a talk. And uh, for that, we have to, to, to create a function that will be called uh, add talk. Uh, but I think that I, I have already seen yeah, it. Yeah, the, uh, that's the constructor. Yeah, let me yeah. start with this. So, the add talk. We are going to analyze this function. So, as we can see, it's a function and it's public. That means that this function can be can be uh, called... Uh, uh, outside the contract. Exactly, outside the, the, the contract. It will receive a set of parameters, a title, a location, start time, end time, speaker address, and speaker name. Forget this for, for now. And here we are just assigning these input parameters to my state variables. This means that this function it is changing the state of my contract. And it's really important because uh, you will see that uh, if you call this function, you will have to pay some gas. And, and, sto and storing data in the state of the contract is one of the most expensive operations, so that's also something to keep in mind. And uh, of course, uh, you don't want that anyone will be able to add a talk. So uh, this function will be allowed only for the contract owner. And the contract owner will be identified by this state variable, variable address owner. So um, how to retrieve this uh, contract owner. Um, we will retrieve this information from the, the, the constructor. So when you create a contract, when you deploy it to the chain, uh, the constructor will, will be called. The constructor is an optional function. You can uh, declare it or not, but here we are going to use it in order to to keep to retrieve the address of the contract owner. And this address is provided by this global properties, global variables called, called msg.sender. You have a set of global variables, but this one is really useful because you will have the address of the contract owner. So, and this can be used in any function that is uh, non-constant. We'll see the difference afterwards, but that's uh, w from within any transaction, you can know which account triggered that transaction. And this is in the MSG that sender. So here we know who has deployed the contract, who is the contract owner. And each time someone is calling the add talk, we will retrieve the address of the function caller to say, hey guys, are you the contract owner? Yes or not? If not, so you are not allowed to to alter the, con the, the, the state of the contract. If yes, we will get all the parameters and we'll change the contract in, in st um, state. Okay, so at talk, it's done. So of course, you, as you see here, we have only one talk and one speaker, so it's basically a meetup. Uh, we'll add more uh, talks and speakers afterwards. And we would like also to retrieve the details of, of, uh, of uh, the talk. So here we have, again, a function. It's, it's called getTalk. It's public. And we have something new here, constant. Constant means that this function is not allowed to change the state of the contract. And it also means that this function is free. You can use it without paying any, any gas. And this function will return a set of properties. The title, the location, start time, end time, speaker address, speaker name. So Solidity supports uh, multiple returns. Yeah. So that's it. We have a smart contract called conference that has a function that will alter the contract state a getter that will return the detail of the contract. And when we deploy the contract, we will be able to identify the contract owner. So I will say that from now, that's OK. So we are ready to deploy it. But to deploy it, we need here to create um, um, a deployment file to inform Truffle that this file, conference.sol, will have to be deployed to, to the 
to the to the blockchain so here we have to create a new file under migrations and this file will be called to uh, the, the, the naming is important especially the prefix because uh, the way that truffle works is kind of unusual for us uh, java guys but uh, the migration scripts are ordered so they are run in sequence uh, based on this prefix and uh, and then that's what is used in the migrations contract to keep track of where uh, the last uh, script uh, was run. So here I have created under the migration folder um, a file called two underscore deploy contract that, uh, so it's not, I have to rename it. Uh, deploy contract, no. Nope. <laughs> So again, the naming is important, <laughs> no, especially the, the prefix part. So. Yeah. Done. And here we will inform Truffle that uh, the, the smart contract that is located in this file, conference.sol, will have to be deployed. That's it. And everything will be managed by Truffle. So how? So it's time to to deploy. To so it will it will compile the Solidity file into a binary file, uh, create the transaction uh, with the network, sign it, send it to the network. Everything is handled by uh, by Truffle for us. Well, well, but b b before deploying the the smart contract, we have to inform the target environment. So Truffle here is providing a file called Truffle.js. This is where you are going to to store all the, the target environment. For example, here we have a, um, a project that was able to deploy contract in different environment. For example, a development environment located in localhost port 8545, or uh, to the ring B test, public test network, or also to the live uh, network, to the main network. An interesting thing to note here is that you can see that the the host doesn't change. It's always local host. And that's a key difference with the, the environments you might be used to, because actually even if you're deploying to the main chain, so to the production network if you want, uh, the host you're deploying to is basically the local node you're running on your own machine. And then it spreads across the network uh, automatically. So here I will inform Truffle that the contract that has been compiled needs to be deployed on local host port 8545. Uh, and it's a development, development uh, uh, platform. So before to do that, I need to start test RPC. I don't know if it's already started, uh, maybe somewhere, yeah, no. So. No. So, test RPC. If it's already started, we'll complain anyway. So test RPC is running. I go to here IntelliJ and I will type some, some comment here. Truffle migrate. And we can see that Truffle is compiling the contract located under the contracts folders. And here it has deployed all the all the contracts the migration that is used by truffle to determine if another contract needs to be deployed but what is really important for us it's this information here deploy conference blah 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 with here an address here it's the hash code of the transaction because we have sent a transaction to the to the to the to the Ethereum nodes saying, hey guys, I want to deploy the contract and I will pass as value the bytecode of, of, the, of the smart contract. And this is something that we have also to mention. When we build a smart contract, well, we'll, we'll create a bytecode that will be uh, uh, executed by the, the Ethereum virtual machine. And this bytecode is sent uh, within the transaction. Can you show the, the console for test RPC? Yeah. Uh, if you want to 
Je... No, no, just the, the, the test RPC terminal. Ah, oh, sorry. Just switch. Yeah. So here you can see all the transactions that have, been, that have been created and how much gas they cost, you know, gas usage and so on. So that's also some information you get from test RPC. Yeah. And it created four transactions, one to deploy the migrations contract, one to update the migrations contract saying the migrations contract was deployed. Okay. Another one to deploy the conference contract, and the last one is to inform migrations that the conference contract was deployed. So this is the migrations is like the the deployment state, if you want. So now, if we want to interact with uh, our smart contract, we have to use a, a console. So we'll use the truffle console here. Okay. Maybe you can uh, reduce, show, um, move up the console. No, no, the I mean, just reduce the window or something. Yeah. Um, before um, interacting with the contract, we need to to get an instance of this contract. And here, to get an instance, I have to name my contract conference deployed. Then. So just to, while he's typing, the, the Truffle, in addition to all those build and test tools, provides us with an abstraction on top of the notion of contract called Truffle contract. And this is the abstraction that uh, Said is using now. To the, so the deployed function and all that is provided by the Truffle contract uh, dependency. And when I hit enter, I have an object that I can use to interact can just, with the... Just type. Just like that, to show that it's just a JSON object containing the structure of the of the contract and all the functions that you can call on it and yeah. so on. Okay. I think your screen is too big. You need to reduce the. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's start by reading our instance of the contract by calling the get talk. If I type up get talk, we can see here that uh, we receive some information, but all the information are empty because by default uh, the the, the instance of the, the contract are set to empty values. For example, here it's normally it's the uh, tall title, description, the start time, the end time, the speaker address, and speaker name. So these values are are empty. Uh, or zero now. or no. I mean, it's default initialized. If I want to see the address of my contract, I can type conference.address and I have the contract of the contract. This is the address where the contract can be found uh, uh, inside the, the, the blockchain. And if I want to add a talk, so I just have to type the add talk function. So the first parameter will be the talk title, talk one, for example. Uh, before that, I, I have to create the, the start time and end time. Yeah. So, so while he's doing that, just to explain the difference, before he called get talk, and as we defined it, get talk is a constant function. So it, it's just reading state from the blockchain, and it doesn't need to send a transaction for that. It has a full copy of the of the ledger locally, so it can just see what the data is in in the local uh, instance. Uh, whereas here, what we are going to be doing is uh, calling the add talk function, and the add talk function actually modifies the state. So we need to put it in a transaction to spread it across the network. It needs to be mined, and so on and so forth. So that's there's a big difference. It's kind of CQRS style of things. There's a big difference between reading data and modifying it. So, oh my God. better and time so here i'm creating my start time again it's not okay just get here number of seconds 
Yeah. So I have here two variables, start time and time. And um, just another word of warning also, as you can see here, those two values, uh, string stuff, uh, it's the start time and end time. Uh, but uh, uh, an unsigned integer in the context of the, the Ethereum virtual blockchain, uh, sorry, Ethereum virtual machine, is actually a 256-bit integer. That's quite a huge, and clearly uh, JavaScript doesn't have that kind of uh, data type. So it's using uh, uh, an alternate data type called a big number, and uh, that's his way of representing it. So that's basically like your uh, your uh, big decimal in uh, in Java or something. So I'm ready to call the at talk. So I need a talk title, location, start time, end time, a speaker address. So I will use one that has been generated by a test RPC. For example, this one. Okay, and a name. John Do. I know that everyone is knowing this guy. So. I'm ready to uh, call. No, uh, you're not ready to call. Uh, no, I'm not ready to call because if I do that, uh, the problem is that uh, we don't know who has to pay for that. You know, the at talk function is a, is a function that will alter the, the state of the contract. So someone has to pay for that. So we need to identify who is calling this function. And for that, I will add an additional parameter called from and I will say, you remember that the at talk has, is only allowed by the contract owner. And right now I can tell you that the contract owner is the account zero. So when you run Truffle Migrate, uh, it will actually automatically deploy. The, if you don't specify, you can specify the sender address in the truffle.js file. If you don't specify it, it will take the first account of the node it's connecting to. So here, a test RPC generated uh, 10 accounts, and we can access them with uh, web3.eth.accounts. And we take the first one, because we know that's the one it was, it, that was used to deploy the contract. And we add that to a kind of a JSON object that is the last parameter. So there are many different uh, metadata uh, elements that you can put in there. Uh, here, we just need the from. Yeah. So suspense, I type, ooh, I have a transaction. So that means that we have called the I talk function and uh, a transaction has been created. This transa transaction needs to be mined by the, the node. And uh, we have here the hash of the transaction. Uh, and we know that the transaction has been mined. It's located in the block number five in the chain data. Uh, it caused uh, uh, this case, th this number of gas, sorry. And, um, well, that's it right now. And, and for that, it's, again, you can specify that, but here it's using the default gas price, uh, which is uh, 20 or 40 gigaways, I don't remember. Anyway, so the, the Ethereum, uh, one Ether is divided into 10 to the power of 18 uh, ways. That's the minimum uh, uh, unit of uh, value. And uh, there's a price in way for each gas unit. So that's how you determine the, the actual cost in Ether. So here I'm going to see if my contract state has been changed or not. I call app get talk and voila. So here inside the smart contract, somewhere in the blockchain, the contract state has been changed. I have the talk one, the room four, so the location has been changed. I have my start time, my end time. I have the address of the speaker and the name of the speaker. And remember this, this address, you know, web3 ETH account zero. As you can see here, TestRPC is creating for us 10, uh, 10 uh, public key and uh, there are available here on the console by typing web 3 accounts. We have an array of these accounts. You can see that they are the same, okay, hopefully. And to identify the owner of the contract, you can type web3eth.conbase. 
and Coinbase is the default account that owns the, um, the, the contract. And here, the Coinbase or Etherbase in Ethereum, it's the address OX017, blah, blah, blah. And by default, we always use the first account for that. Unless you override it in truffle.js, that is. Okay. So, uh, and of course, here you can retrieve the information from the, um, the get talk. Huh? Here you received here an array of information, and um, I think you can you can type get talk. Then function. Data. So the truffle contract uh, abstraction uses promises all, the, all over the place. And uh, yeah. But when you return multiple values from a, from a function, uh, then you can uh, access them in an array. For example, here I have retrieved the, the position two of my array and it's uh, the, the start yeah. time. Okay, so in summary, we have what we have done here. First, we have created a contract called Conference. We said, hey guys, the recommendation is to use a compiler that is compliant with the version of my smart contract. We have created a set of variables. This is, this is the state of my contract. The first iteration of this DAP is to say, we are just creating one talk and to get the detail of this talk. So we have here a function called add talk that is public. And this function is altering the state of the contract. So we'll have to pay some gas for that. But this function is only allowed for the contract owner, as the contract owner has been stored when the contract has been deployed. We have retrieved the, uh, the address of the contract owner and store it um, into the owner um, address variable. And then we are able to retrieve the information from the smart contract uh, thanks to the function getTalk. The function is public. Okay, and okay. it's a constant. That means that I can call this function 1,000 or 1 million times. I will not pay for that. It's free because it's a read-only function. This, this function is not allowed to uh, alter the, 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 the contract. And, uh, and we have, means. of course, here created a file to see when we will deploy the contract I need to retrieve the contract located in this file. And then, by default, when I type truffle migrate, please deploy the contract that I have just built into uh, the Ethereum node located uh, under localhost port 8045. And the, 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 this, uh, this node is the test RPC that we have started okay. before. That's so, now we wrote our first smart contract, we uh, deployed it and everything, but it's very important to remember that blockchains are immutable. So when, we, when you deploy something, when you deploy a, a contract, which is, as I said before, like a, a web service of sorts, uh, to the blockchain, it's immutable. So uh, it cannot be modified after it's been deployed. Yeah. Sorry, to... I forgot to mirror my screen. So it cannot be modified after it's been deployed. So it's very, it's even more critical in a blockchain environment to actually uh, test everything that you do before you go live. And that's what we're going to see now. How do you uh, unit test such a, a contract? So that's exactly the contract that uh, Said showed you. Um, and I'm going to show you how to uh, test it. Um, so there are mostly three strategies for testing smart contracts. Uh, of course, you can run unit tests, and usually you do that on test RPC. You don't want to be running unit tests in a main chain because then you will pay for running your tests, 
and then you will not do it, which is bad. So let's do that on test RPC. Once you have unit tested your contracts, you can also integration test them. Uh, and you can do that either on your own private blockchain, so you can create kind of the, your own development network if you want, or you can do it on one of the public test chains. So Ethereum, in addition to the main chain, there are a, several, a certain number of test nets that you can use that are public, that you can share with everybody. So when you deploy something in there, uh, the Ether is not real, again, uh, it's fake money, but, uh, but still you can deploy your contracts there and share them with your friends for, for user testing, for example. And uh, now what we're going to show you is how to do it on TestRPC. Uh, again, when you do it in TestRPC, there are, uh, I mean, when you unit test your contract, you can do it in two ways, uh, either using JavaScript, and that's what we're going to do. You can also use uh, Solidity, so you can have a contract that's used as a test that calls your contract. Uh, but that technique is kind of new and not very well documented so far. So uh, I'm going to focus on, on the JavaScript part. Um, what else would I want to say? Yeah, so uh, the first thing we're going to do is just start the start PC again. So I'm on a different machine, so I'm doing it directly in there. Okay, again, 10 new accounts. The, the accounts are random, by the way. You can uh, start test RPC with some command line arguments so that it always creates the same accounts, which can be practical in some, uh, in some ways, but yeah. So test RPC is running in the background. We don't need to care about it for now. Uh, now I'm going to create a new test in that test folder, and that's going to be a JavaScript file. So just call it conference, sorry conference test dot js okay and there we are going to copy some code so let me show you what it does same thing as in the deployment uh, script uh, we need to import the conference smart contract the source uh, just to let, know, uh, to let Truffle know that it needs to compile that and it needs to deploy that before we can run the test. Uh, and then uh, Truffle integrates with uh, Mocha and uh, Chai. Uh, so I think it's Mocha for the test framework and Chai for the assertions or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you can use just that for testing your, your smart contracts. So uh, instead of having a, a test here, we have a contract uh, directive. Uh, that takes the just the name of the contract that we want to run. This can be anything, but it's better if the name of the contract. And the function that will uh, be in, uh, used to test uh, takes a, a list of accounts and parameter, and that's the accounts that are available on the node uh, that we are using. And this is very useful because when we will test some uh, actual calls with transactions, we'll need those accounts uh, to send... Uh, I mean, to pay for, for the execution of those functions. Then uh, we use, uh, actually it's uh, uppercase C here, uh, conference.deployed, same thing as we did in the Truffle console. It's really the same instruction. Uh, then function, we get an instance. And then once we have an instance of a deployed contract, we can call the get talk function on it. Okay, uh, and then in the return, and by the way, this, when you, when you call, um, uh, a function that triggers a transaction, this then is only executed after the block has been mined. Here, there is no block that needs to be mined because it's a, it's a constant function. And then we can use asserts just to check that theoretical values match the real values that we get. Okay? And that's really all there is to it. Now that we have that, we can go back to the terminal, open a new window, and here use truffle test, and what Truffle test will do is compile the contracts that have not been compiled in a while, uh, deploy them to the, to the, I mean, to test RPC in our case, and, and run the test. And it will redeploy the contract for every test suite. And a test suite is just one of the JavaScript files. So you can have several test cases in each state suite, and each test suite gets a, a, a blank slate in terms of state. So here I'm running Truffle tests. It compiles the contracts and deploys them. And here we have conference is not defined yet because I was actually using the wrong case in both. So now I can run the tests again, redeploy the contracts, 
And we're good. We have a passing test. Yay! First one. So, uh, and here, of course, if I check, for example, for a non-existing value, and I run the test, it will fail. And sometimes the error messages are very useful, sometimes they're a little less than that, but still. Um, so the test passes. Now, I want to show you how to test the add a talk. So for that, we'll add a couple of variables to our tests. So inside of the contract structure, I will add a couple of variables, okay? So uh, we'll use a variable to store the contract instance, one to store the owner of the contract, just all the, the, the fields that we'll pass to the get to the add talk function, and that's basically it, okay? So now we can add a new test case to the test suite, uh, right after here. Okay, so let's go over it. Uh, this one will test uh, what happens when we add a talk. So again, uh, we'll need to call uh, conference.deployed, okay? Uh, and then we get an instance. That's always the same mechanism. This time we're saving it. And then on it, we're calling contract instance.addTalk, okay? With all the values that we've defined above and the special uh, parameter at the end that we use to specify uh, who we want uh, to deploy the contract. And in that case, that's the owner, which corresponds to the first address of the first account. Okay? When we call the add talk function, uh, we wait for the block to be mined. So again, this uh, abstraction makes sure that we only get uh, notified when important information is available. So once the, this transaction has been triggered and mined, then we can uh, query the state of the contract by using contract instance.getTalk, and then we should have all the same uh, value as we had uh, stored. Okay? So pretty straightforward. By the way, you can see that I can use the two number function on a big number to transform it into a JavaScript number so that I can test it. Uh, of course, I take the risk that if my number is really big, then I'm going to lose some information. But here is just the start time and an end time. It should, should be good. Okay, I'm run truffle tests again. And here we have two passing tests. My God, I'm on a roll. Uh, this was not prepared at all, of course. Uh, and that's it. That's how you unit test your code. So again, smart contracts, it's really important to test them. Once you release them into the wild, then you're, if something happens, you're screwed. Uh, by the way, something like that happened in June 2016. Uh, some contracts were poorly tested and they were released in production and it resulted in $50 million being lost or something. So yeah, unit tests are your friends. Uh, now the other thing I want to show you in addition to tests is how to get notified when something happens in your contract. So with events, your contracts can communicate with your application, with your, uh, especially with your front end. So let's say, for example, I'm running uh, the front end, I'm going to show you later, and somebody adds a talk, I would like to be notified so that I can reload the screen and show the, the added talk. Um, there is a way to do that in Solidity, it's called events. And uh, what's important to understand is that events are actually like logs. So they are added to the blockchain, but not, they're not part of the blockchain state. They are in a different uh, data structure in the blockchain that you can watch for events and uh, interact with. But only external accounts, uh, sorry, only external applications can view those events. Contracts themselves have no access to them. They can send events, but then they don't know who is processing them and so on. And more importantly, they cannot watch events. Okay, so here we're going back to our conference contract. And we are going to define uh, an event that will be used to notify uh, uh, watchers when a new talk is added. So to do that, I'm just going to go uh, right here and add this event. So that's the way you declare an event with the event keyword. Uh, that's the name of the event. And then I, I can associate a couple of uh, fields to my events. And that will be useful for the watchers to know what, what happened exactly. Um, 
And that's it for the declaration. Now, of course, I need to use uh, that event. And I will do that directly in the uh, add talk function. So once the add talk function has uh, successfully saved uh, everything, I can go there and call the add talk event and pass it the title, the start time, and the end time. And that's it. When I do that, that later I can watch uh, this event and, uh, and react on it. Okay, I will save this and I will redeploy this contract. Now, test RPC is still running in the back end. It's in memory, but it's still running in the back end. So it still has the old versions of the contract deployed and we actually already run both migration scripts, one and two, okay? So if I run just truffle migrate now, which I will do, okay? If I just run truffle migrate, Actually, it's redoing it, Wait. Oh, because I changed the contract and it detected it now. Yeah, okay. So if I just run after the contracts have already been deployed, it will say, okay, network is up to date. I already run both migration scripts as confirmed by the migration state. So it should be good. If you want to force the latest version to be deployed, you have to use minus, uh, dash dash reset and then it will force everything to be deployed again. Okay, now contracts are deployed and everything, so I can run Truffle console again. Okay, just push that up a little bit. And with that, I will be able to interact with my contract again. So same thing as before, we started a new console here, so we need to get a new instance of our contract conference.deployed, then function instance app equals instance, oops, uh, yeah, no, I made a mistake. I, th I thought there was one too much parentheses, yeah, that's it, okay. Nope, that's better. Okay, so now we have app that contains the interface to our contract, and we can actually watch uh, our event. So for example, I will add uh, app, add talk event. Okay, so I want to watch this event, and then, so this is the way I get the access to the event, and then I call the watch function on it, and this will have, unfortunately, that's not very consistent. Here it's a good old error uh, data uh, callback. It's not a promise. Uh, and here I will just console log it. That's one of the main difficulties when you're working with this set of tools right now. It's Still very inconsistent. Sometimes you have promises, sometimes you have callbacks, sometimes uh, you have nothing. And uh, yeah, it's kind of frustrating, but it's, you, you get used to it. Uh, and the, the things that we can add to the ad talk event is a way to filter which events we want to watch. So you can use a first object uh, that can be used to filter on the values of the field that we have uh, added to the events. Here we'll just take all events. And you can also say, uh, the which range of block you want to uh, of blocks sorry that you want to observe. So here we want to uh, observe only the latest block and not the whole chain. Okay, I don't think this is right, is it? Yeah, should be. Okay, we'll see. So now that we have that, let's recreate our start time equals new date. OK. 
to stay here. Whatever, we'll just keep it that way. Okay, that's our start time. And we'll do the same for end time. Let's say we have a talk that lasts a full day. Come on. <laughs> and then we can call the add talk again. Okay, so let's call it talk one. It will be in room one. Start at start time and at end time. Uh, I can use one of the accounts. You can change your own terminal just to oh, yeah. get that. Indeed. <sighs> or just type easy. Web3 ETH accounts. Oh, yeah, you're right. Web3.eth accounts uh, six, for example. Ever. Okay, so that's my speaker address and then uh, my speaker name, John Doe again. And of course, I need to specify from which account I want to send that, and that would be web3.eth.conbase accounts one. Of course, I can do that, right? <clears throat> wink, wink. So it sent a transaction, but we see that the logs are empty. So no event was triggered. And we didn't get the callback either. Okay, So that's the kind of thing that can happen. Uh, you have something that gets an error, but you don't get any obvious sign that something wrong happened. But here, something wrong obviously happened because we didn't use the right account to send a transaction from. And when we do that, oh, we get a transaction and an event. So this time, uh, I'm just going to show you again the, oops, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so here, what you can see is that after we uh, called the function here, uh, okay, so this one was sent with the account zero, we get the transaction receipt with the transaction hash, all the data, we have some logs, and logs contain actually the events that were triggered inside this transaction. And here we have the add talk event type. And since we registered a watcher on, the, on that event, uh, we also have a console log afterwards that contains exactly the same thing as the logs here and uh, gives us information about add talk event. And we have the args that contain uh, the values that were uh, sent with the event. Okay, so that's how you can watch an event and later on you can do that also in JavaScript uh, in your front end to be notified when something uh, happens. By the way, this mechanism of events is very important because uh, you've seen that we used returns for uh, constant functions, but there is no way to return anything from a non-constant function. So when your function is actually modifying the state of the, of the blockchain, uh, it does it in an asynchronous way, so you need to send a transaction, the transaction needs to be mined and so on, so you don't have direct access to the return values, yet. They are uh, incrementally adding this kind of feature to the, to the language and to the EVM, but for now, there is no way. So events are the only way by which you can make sure that uh, you get some, uh, some real value. Okay, now that we have added this... Uh, event as i said before we need to test everything so let's go back to our conference test and we'll add a new test case that will test that an event is correctly triggered when we call add talk okay so this will be uh that's it okay so same thing as before here, uh, we're, just, uh, we're just calling conference.deployed. I'll definitely need to change that later on. Uh, we just need to call conference.deployed to get a deployed instance of our contract. We call the add talk function again from the owner, same as before. 
But this time, uh, we get a function receipt. So earlier, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, use that. Uh, yeah, here, we didn't use it, OK? But now, we can access the transaction receipt. And this transaction receipt, among other things, contains a logs field. So we can check that we indeed received just one event. Um, and we can check the data, both the name of the event and the args of this event. OK? And when I do that, go back here. Actually, I will open a new terminal and run truffle test. And we have three passing tests. So that's it. We showed you how to unit test your smart contracts and how to use events to get notified. This will be very important in the front end later on. And uh, I think the next step will be to show you how to uh, register, an attendee. register an attendee. But we'll probably do that after the break, right? Yeah. Okay. 15 minutes break. So 15 minute okay break. Let's come back at uh, yeah 11.25 or something. And, uh, and then we'll show you the rest. So before we start again, I just wanted to uh, answer for everybody one of the questions that we had at the break, uh, because I, I realize now that it can be disturbing. When we, when we run a transaction, when we call the add talk function, we specify the account we send the transaction from, okay? And we just indicate the public key, the address of that account. And you might think, okay, but then it means that anybody can call this function without any other form of authentic authentication. Well, actually not. Uh, what happens behind the scenes is that we are using TestRPC, and TestRPC is a development uh, environment. It's an emulator. So by default, all the accounts that are created for us, the 10 accounts that are created for us at the beginning, are unlocked all the time. Okay, So you don't need to specify any sort of authentication. It can use the accounts directly. On a real chain, all these accounts would be locked with a private key. So you need to have access to the private key in order to be able to sign the transaction and then to call the function. And uh, of course, we, you cannot pass the private key directly as a parameter. That would be a security issue, a security risk. Uh, but you, what you can do is unlock the account before sending the transaction. And you can do that with some commands in uh, Truffle Console, for example. And, uh, and then after that, you can call uh, the function and it will use the, uh, uh, the private key to sign the, the, contract, the, the call. So that's also something I wanted to clarify. Uh, so now we're going to show you how to register attendees for our talks, uh, which will be useful because if you remember, people will be able to register using cryptocurrency. Okay, so um, in this step, um, we are... Bigger. We are going, bigger. Sorry? Bigger. Bigger. No. We are going to register an attendee. Why? Because here we are creating a voting system, so you guys, you will be able to vote for, for a talk. But um, the, the requirement is that uh, an attendee has to pay a fee to attend the conference. So to be an attendee, you have to pay a fee for the conference. This is what we are going to, to implement. So here we will see uh, an interesting notion called uh, the value. Um, the value that will be um, sent with the transaction. Um, so here, um, we'll start from uh, this version of the project. We have the, the at talk and the get talk and the events and the testing. That's great. And now we are going to create a payable function called register. We'll see what is a, a payable function. So here, I'm going to create some um, variables to for the first one will be used to hold the address of the attendee so your address your ethereum address the public address your name and here we have a constant um, variable that will hold the price and you can see here that the price is not expressed in in ether but in way so uh, the ether is, is the, the value that is used in Ethereum, but inside the EVM, we have a kind of metric system used to, um, to codify this, uh, these values. And the base unit in uh, Ethereum is called Way. 
uh, you can use some uh, um, website to convert uh, an ether, for example, in way. For example, one ether is, I would say, one yeah. exponent, 18. Yeah, 10, 18. 18 way. So the registration fee will cost, let's check, 1.8 ether. And now we are going to create the register function. So uh, here it's a so Just as a point of information, as of right now, Ethereum is $300. One Ether is getting $300. So here the requirement is to say, if you want to register to a conference, you will have to pay a fee. The, registr the re registration price and the value that will send to the smart contract will be must be equal to this registration price. Uh, and also, you 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 are not allowed to reg register twice. So we'll check if you are not already registered to the conference. And then, if everything is okay, we'll be able to alter the state of the contract and to say, okay, you are allowed to register to the conference. And here we have a, a new function called register. And if we check this function, it will receive only one uh, parameter, uh, the full name. Um, and here we can see that it's a function called register uh, with a parameter. The function is public. And we have something new here, payable. Payable means that this function is allowed to receive value, is allowed to receive money from the function caller. For example, at talk, here, it's a function, public function, but it's, it's not allowed to receive any value from, from the function caller. Uh, caller. And it's important to understand that this value that you can send to a function call is separate from the gas. Okay, The gas is the operational cost of your call, but here it's really a payment that you can associate with your call. So here we are using the, the, the require function that will ensure that the value that you have sent is equal to the registration price. That is the constant that we have defined on top of the, the, the code. So here we have another global um, value that is provided uh, in, in our code. You remember the message dot sender that contains the address of the function caller, and here message.value contains the value sent by the function caller, caller to, the, to, the, to the function. So here, if it's okay, great, we can, we can uh, run the, the, the next line, and here we will ensure that the message sender is not already registered. So again, this is a small conference, one talk, one speaker, one attendee. One attendee. So it's really sad. Hey, sad we start conference. simple, it's an MVP. Okay. <laughs> Later on, we'll add more registers. And if the rules are okay, so you can store the message sender to the attendee address, the full name in the attendee name, and then to, to trigger an event, a register event. So I have here to create this event. Uh, it's one. Uh, okay. So I have an event called register event that will uh, that will provide uh, the address of the the attendee and uh, his name. Okay, that's it. Uh, and just yeah, one thing that he didn't show you is when you when you specify the arguments of an event, you can mark them as indexed, and when they are indexed, it makes it faster and easier to filter events just by this value. So for example, yeah. if you want to uh, filter events uh, that are where uh, a specific attendee registered, then you can uh, use this indexed uh, argument. And here we are also to create an additional function, a constant function. So a function that is free, free of charge. And this function is called is registered. Um, is register will be used to know if you are already registered to the to the conference or not. And here we received an address and a, that is the, the the account your account for example. 
and to check if this account is already registered or not. For example, this 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 function can be used by the the organ organizer of the conference just to to check if you are if you are already registered or not. Um, and that's it. If you are not registered, it returns false. Otherwise, it returns true. When also another thing that is important. Uh, you can see the, this require call. That's also something new. It's basically like an assert. Uh, it's provided by uh, by Solidity, and what it means is that if the condition is not verified, then it th it throws an exception, and that will be somewhat better uh, than what we had before. When you remember in the ad talk, uh, if the uh, owner of the contract was not the message sender then we simply returned. And we didn't have any exception. As you saw, we just had a, a successful transaction. Uh, with the exception, the transaction will actually fail and we'll get an exception. So this require thing is, uh, is important. OK, that's it. We can build and deploy this version of our contract. In this terminal, I have um, start test RPC. And here I'm going to migrate my contract, migrate. You can check here, okay, the contract has been deployed. And then, I can open the the console, Truffle console. I will get an instance of my contract. Okay. And now I will. Um, I would like to listen for my my event just to be sure that uh, uh, the register has um, has been done properly. So I will create a, a register event variable. I would like to hear for my event this one. So what is doing here by recording the reference that's, re that's returned from the, the watch function is just a way to keep a handle on the event so that you can unwatch it later. That's also a good practice, especially when you're running this from the front end, to not watch event all the times because otherwise you, can, you don't know what happens if you're not there to, to listen. So yeah, then later on we can use register event reference to unwatch the event. And here I will filter my event uh, for the account three because it will be the account that I will use as uh, as uh, the the attendee of the conference. Watch. And you don't here. specify a range. Sorry. No. You don't specify no. a range of blocks. Okay. You, you you are not obliged to specify a range. By default, it will be uh, from latest to to latest. So here is using the uh, filter parameter that we left uh, empty before. And now I will display my event here. Event. Okay. Hey, first time. So uh, now I'm ready to register the account three. But before doing that, we will check the balance of this of this account. So I will call this function web3 eth get balance for the account web3 dot eth dot accounts three, and we can see here that the the account three has uh, a lot of way. A lot so of way. That's the problem. With, so, so all the units manipulated by the the contracts are also uh, always in way. And fortunately for us, there are a few uh, functions that are available on the, the Web3 library uh, that allow us to uh, convert Way uh, to Ether and Ether to Way and so on. So always remember that because uh, sometimes you're, you don't understand why. Ah, oh, I, I send one Ether to my contract and it's not working. No, because you send one Way. It's not enough. So. so. 
And here I have used uh, Web3 from Way for the balance, so I can see that here. Uh, this function is converting a way to, to Ether, so I can see that the balance of the account 3 contains 100 Ether. So, can you check also the, the balance of the contract? Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. So, so the, uh, that's also an, an important thing to understand is that every account that you create has a balance in Ether, but every contract also has a balance. So you can actually send money to a contract, and that's what we're going to do with the payable function. So here we can just call the get balance function on the contract address in the same way as we did it for, for a real account, I mean for uh, an external account as it's called. And right, right now, the contract has no ether in, uh, its, in its balance. balance. Now, I'm going to register this guy. So, register. I have to give a name. So, Rick Descartes, plan to attend the conference. And the attendee will be the account three. Yeah, and here we have to pass another parameter called value. This is the value that you are willing to pay, that you are willing to send to the to the transaction. And here, remember, the conference cost one point point eight ether. So I will use here Web three two way because I don't want to write this value in way. I will type 1.8 and to see this value is given in ether. Yeah. Okay. Register Rick Descartes from account 3. I send 1.8 ether from my wallet and I'm ready to go. And you can hit see here we have received an event. This event is called, has been triggered by register event, and the address of the attendee is ox85 blah blah blah, and the name is Rick Descartes. If I check here my. Um, you can just call it back. Hello? You can just call it back with the up, uh, up arrows. You want to show the balance? Yeah, yeah. You can just. Uh, of course. Yeah. So if I check the balance of the account three, you can see here that we have paid something. So 1.8 ether for the conference and some additional uh, um, ethers for, for the gas in order to, to, to validate the, the transaction. And if I want to check the balance of the contract here, we can see that the contract has received 1.8 ether. Okay, so uh, now if we want to be sure that everything uh, is done properly, we have to add some testing. Uh, we have to improve the test in order to be sure that uh, everything is okay. So I will take the, this file, confirm test, and I will add some additional uh, parameter, for example. Can you make it bigger? Is this not very yeah, yeah. So here I will... Uh, add some um, variable, the registration price, the attendee here, I will use the account one, well, it doesn't matter, you can put three if you want, a full name, and we will check the balance before and after the, the call. And at the end, I will add my new test case. Um, no? With a small email. So here we will check if uh, we can register uh, to a conference. So we will get, first we'll get here the balance before the call. We'll get the balance for the attendee and for the conference. And we'll keep it in these variables. So uh, balance attendee before, contract before. And then we will try to register this, uh, this attendee, this, uh, this account. 
by providing the uh, uh, the full name. And then here, the second part is to uh, is to um, Says, yeah. First, we call the register and we want to be sure that an event has been triggered by the function. Because as you can see here, if the event is triggered, that means that everything has, has been executed properly because it's the last in instruction of your function. And if, uh, if a require condition is not met, and it throws an exception, and of course it interrupts the execution of the of the uh, of the function. And even better than that, since transactions are supposed to be atomic, uh, it reverts all the change uh, all the changes that you already did to the contract state. So it really goes back to how it was before. The only price you have to pay, uh, if you want, is the gas up to that point. So if there was some gas consumed before. Uh, you throw an exception, then this gas is lost. It's, it go, it's, lost, it's not lost for everyone. It's actually paid to the miner who mined the block containing that transaction. But uh, that's a price to pay for throwing exception, if you want. So here, I have re received my register event. I check the, the address of the, the attendee and the, the full name, just to be sure that everything is, has been done correctly. And then... I will call here. I will check if the the attendee is properly registered. So I will call the constant function is registered. And normally, of course, the value should be true. And here we will check the balance after the call. So we will retrieve the balance from the attendee from the conference, and we'll make a check just to be sure that the asser assertion is is correct. And here you see that the test is using, uh, so for the contract balance, it will be exactly 1.8 Ether, because that's what was, was sent by the, the attendee. But the, uh, the, ba the balance of the attendee itself is less than uh, the amount he paid. Uh, I mean, it's 100 minus 1.8 to pay for the fee, minus a small amount for the gas. And this amount is kind of hard to predict because it depends on the complexity of the code that was effectively executed. Mm. So this is kind of a loose test to make sure that uh, uh, it's, yeah, the comparison is okay. So let's try, let's test our project, truffle, test, suspense. Great, we are able to register an attendee. Cool, magical. And the, 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 the last step re regarding the registration is that you, you, you can also test uh, the exception. For example, here you can add another test suite called conference exceptions.js. And this guy is this one. OK. What we are going to do here is to uh, simulate an error. And um, here we are going to try to register uh, an attendee, but with the wrong price. As you can see here, we should receive an exception. If we receive an exception, and in our case, because we are using require, so if we receive a revert from the contract, that's okay. This means that the, the smart contract is processing the exception properly. But if the function has managed the, the call, uh, uh, I would say, uh, and it was able to register the attendee, it means that we'll be in the then um, section and that's not okay. So we have to to uh, fail the the test case. Uh, by the way, something that might be disturbing also for you Java developers in the room: uh, when you throw an exception in Java, you can associate a message with it. 
Not in solidity. Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. It's going to come, but it has a cost in terms of development and stuff. So uh, actually, the last hard fork that happened two weeks ago uh, is going to enable that. Mm -hmm. But for now, the only thing you know is that something happened. And then you have to figure it out by yourself, by using console logs and stuff, uh, or by using some debugger that's uh, also been released recently. So as you can see, there are some things that are myth missing, but uh, at least we can test that an exception occurred. Now I can run truffle test, and truffle test will run all the test suites that, that are available under the, the test folders. As you can see here, of course, we can uh, add a talk, uh, register an attendee, and uh, we can also, ch uh, ver we have verified that if we try to register an attendee with the wrong price, the smart contract is working as expected. And uh, well, you can, if you want, you can execute, you can test a specific test suite, for example, truffle test from test folder, conference, exceptions, by providing the name as an input parameter, it will run only a specific test suite. So that's it. Guys, you are ready to attend the conference and to, to vote. We have a question here. Why don't we need to? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, good question. Well, just to show you that you can. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly. You, 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 you can define a guess or you can use the default value. What's important to understand here is when you specify the gas, it's not the real gas. It's the maximum gas you're ready to spend. Yeah. So by default, uh, when you send, when you call a contract like that, uh, Truffle will insert a default gas value. And again, that's a max. That's not the exact amount because the exact amount is unpredictable uh, thanks to them, some algorithmic th theorem I won't go into. But it's impossible to predict the complexity of some uh, of running some code in advance. So here is just a, a way to say, okay, for this call, I'm willing to spend, I don't know, 500,000 uh, gas units right now. Uh, if we go over that, if the, ex the real execution of the code reaches that limit, it's like it, it will throw an exception indeed. So all the state will be reverted. And uh, if, I added, if I send some value uh, along, I will get it back, but I will pay the gas anyway. So that's a way, again, the, 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 the gas mechanism is a way to avoid spam, spamming the network. If I didn't have to pay for uh, exception throwing, then I, would just, uh, I could just send invalid transactions to the network all the time, and I, will, I would spam the network with uh, invalid transactions. So it's a way to disincentivize uh, wrong transactions. It's really an interesting question. For example, here I have simulated an error. I have provided the gas that is really, really low, 1,000. And when I try to run my, uh, my test case, it tells me, well, something wrong happened. But here, I want to know exactly what happens. So I have used console log and to display the error. And the error message is... Uh, base fee excess gas limit. Base fee excess gas limit. And it can be it can be a way to identify how many ga gas will be required by by your your function, for example. Okay. So that's it. So when you specify, by the way, again, this is a, a maximum. So if you specify five hundred thousand and only a hundred thousand is used, you get the four hundred thousand back. Mm -hmm. so it's really just a way to uh, to protect uh, yourself against infinite loops and stuff like that. Okay, so now we have uh, one attendee, one speaker, one talk. Uh, it's time to uh, boost uh, our contract and make it more useful by adding the possibility to create and uh, retrieve several talks. Because usually in a conference you have several talks. Okay, so uh, first of all, we'll add the possibility to keep track of several talks in the contract state. And we'll modify, of course, the add talk function to uh, update that list. Uh, we'll retrieve the list of uh, IDs for each talk, and uh, for that we'll demonstrate the use of st uh, structured types and mappings. 
so structured types are a way for uh, contracts to, is it my screen already? Yeah. Uh, so structure types are a way to keep the fields that are related to a single entity together. Okay, so uh, as we said before, a contract can be seen like a class, but it's really not. Uh, it's just the same level of abstraction, I would say. And structure types are just like structs in other languages. It's just for storing uh, data, uh, I mean, yeah, data objects, if you want. And mappings are kind of like hash maps in Java. So they're associative arrays uh, where you can associate a key to a value. Um, but you'll see that they have some uh, specificities in, uh, in Solidity. Uh, but first of all, uh, we will clean up the contract a little bit because there is uh, kind of mixed responsibilities in there. Uh, if you remember early on, we used in the add talk function, here we use this this test that checks if the message sender is the owner of the contract and if not, returns. What we should do here is actually require, use the require function so that it throws an exception. That's one thing. And another thing is that this has nothing to do with the business, uh, uh, with the business of our function. It's mostly authorization code. So we'll put that somewhere else where it's more adapted and where it can be reused. And for that, we'll use a new uh, feature. Well, it's not new in the sense that it's been there for a long time, but new will show it to you. Um, it's called modifiers. Okay. So here, uh, inside the um, the, uh, the contract at the beginning, I will add a, a new modifier that is called only owner. Okay. So modifiers in Solidity are kind of like very very simple aspects. Okay, they're a way to uh, surround your uh, function code with uh, some other code and do it in a reusable way. So here, the only owner will check that the message sender is the owner of the contract. If not, it will throw an exception. If this passes, then we use the underscore uh, character here to uh, represent the code of our function. Okay, so I could also do something after. So it's really like, a, again, a very simple aspect. Okay? And this is a reusable authorization modifier that I can then apply to uh, every function that needs it. So for example, in the add talk function, we will remove this test now. And here, after the public, we will add the only owner modifier. Okay? So that will apply our modifier to our function quite literally, that is that the, the compiler will add the code of the modifier injected into uh, the bytecode of our uh, function. Okay, so it's very, uh, very raw like that. Um, and thanks to that, if we try to call add talk from another account than the contract owner, then it will fail, we'll get an exception. Okay. Now, another thing that uh, is important uh, that, I mean, it's an occasion to show you is that uh, this authorization uh, pattern is actually quite common. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, situations, occasions where you want to check that uh, the caller of a function is really the one that deployed the contract. So uh, to do that, to make it more reusable even, uh, we can use inheritance. So yes, Solidity, supports uh, inheritance and it supports multiple inheritance. So one contract can inherit from several other contracts. Here we will create a new contract called ownable. No, don't want it. Okay. And uh, I will actually replace the code. So again, same thing. We specify the, the pragma for the Solidity compiler version. And then we keep track of the owner address in here, okay? In the in what we will use soon as the super the superclass, uh, we declare the uh, only owner modifier right here, and we also declare the constructor of our ownable contract that will uh, register. I mean, uh, keep track of the owner of the contract, okay? And then inside conference, we can modify the conference contract to inherit from ownable. 
But of course, here it doesn't know what ownable is because we need to import that contract. So here at the beginning, oops, we can just add the import ownable.sol. It's in the same directory. So this is just a way to let him know. And then we can say conference is ownable. Thanks to that, we can remove this uh, state variable. We don't need to keep track of it here. And that's pretty much it, I think. Uh, yeah, we can. We don't have any constructor here, but uh, since uh, it's, pre it's the same as Java to, uh, to some extent, uh, there is a default constructor that's going to be generated for us by the compiler, and it will call the super construct uh, constructor automatically. So it will keep track of this uh, owner state variable. OK. And I think that's it. So now uh, we didn't change anything to our functionality. Uh, so truffle test should work just the same. And it does. OK. So you could actually add a test case now that checks that uh, an exception is thrown when you try to call the add talk uh, function from the wrong account, but we'll leave it to you as an exercise. Uh, now that you know how to catch exception in new test and so on. Uh, so now that we've done this little bit of cleanup, let's actually uh, make it possible to store several talks in our contract. To do that, we will define a new structure type. So we'll do that at the beginning of the contract. Okay, actually two, uh, two structure types, one for talks and one for speakers. Okay, so talks will contain uh, the title, location, start time, end time. Uh, I added this canceled field uh, that's going to be used uh, later and a list of speakers, an array of addresses. Okay, and the ID is new. It's just a way now that we will have several talks to uniquely identify each talk. We'll have also a structured type for speakers with, again, the address of the account and the full name. And this time, the full name will store it as a bytes32. Yeah, before that, it was stored as a string. Um, and bytes32 is a special data type in, uh, in Solidity that contains a fixed size array of characters. Okay, so it's always going to be maximum 32 characters, whereas a string can be a variable size array. Again, one thing to understand is that we are running in, a, in an environment uh, where every byte counts. Every uh, data that you store in the contract states has a cost in terms of real money. So it's very important to choose your data types very carefully. And here we're using byte 32 because we know that the full name of a speaker is never going to be that long. And also because there are some limitations in Solidity that prevent us from doing some things with some data types and especially returning a viable array of viable uh, size types is not allowed yet. So that's going to be an issue for later. OK, so we have both our structured types. And now we will be able to store uh, a collection of talks. We'll do it for, for talks, speakers. It's the, the same logic afterwards. Uh, so to do that, we'll add so first of all, we can get rid of uh, those variables for uh, speakers and talks. We'll keep the attendee stuff for now. OK, and here we'll add some variables to keep track of things. This was before. OK, so now we added three state variables. OK. Talks, speakers, and total talks. Uh, for that, we're using the mapping type. Now, as I said, the mapping type is an associative array, kind of like a hash map, where you can associate a value to a key. The value can be any data type, including a structure type, which is what we used here. And the key can be anything that is unique, of course. And here we're using uh, uh, integer IDs for talks, and we're using the address of the speaker uh, for speakers. One thing that is important to understand, and again, it's a little weird, is that mappings are associative arrays, but there is no way to check if a key exists, if it's been assigned a value, and there is no way to iterate over it as a consequence of that. 
Okay? So the only way to know which talks exist for us will be to keep track of the number of talks. And then we know that every ID from one to the number of talks has been assigned. And the others, when if we try to, for example, if there are two talks and we want the title of the third one, we'll just get an empty value. Not null, not an exception, just an empty value. Okay? So again, that's a, a weird thing in in the in the uh, in the EVM, but that's something that's necessary because of how it works. Okay, now that we've done that, we can modify the uh, the add talk to take that into account. Actually, I will completely replace uh, this function uh, here some room for it. So, we have the add talk function. It takes the same parameters as before at the beginning, the title, the location, the start time, and the end time. But this time, a talk can have several speakers. Unfortunately, there's one thing that we cannot do with Solidity yet, is to send a, a parameter that is a, a list or a mapping of structured types. So here we can only send a list of uh, primitive types, and in that case, that will be addresses and bytes thirty twos. Okay, so we have to pass it as different arrays, and then we'll have to check that those arrays have the right size and so on. It's again using the only owner modifier that we declared in the ownable uh, superclass. Then we check uh, the input values using require. So we check that we actually have a title, uh, that the start time is, over, is uh, above zero, that the end time is after the start time, and that we actually have some address, with some addresses for the speakers. Again, normally you would also have to check that the, the array of speaker addresses is the same size as the array of speaker names, and so on and so forth, but you get the gist. Then once all the input parameters are okay, we First, increment the total talks uh, counter because we will use it to assign some real values to our mapping. And again, a mapping is just an associative array, so we can just uh, do this. Okay, so talks, I pass the key, and I can assign each field of my structured type. By the way, structured types are syntactic sugar added by Solidity, but the EVM has no knowledge of it which is why there are some limitations with it. Um, and that's it. And then we iterate over uh, the speaker addresses uh, array. And for each one, we make sure that uh, there is an address and that it's not null. And, uh, and then we, again, create a new speaker with this data and we add it to the talks. Okay, so we, st we establish this many-to-many -many relationship between uh, talks and speakers. And when everything works, then we can trigger the add talk event. But this time, we pass another parameter, total talks, that will correspond to the ID of the new talk that was added. So that means that we need to update the, uh, the event as well. So if we go up, add talk event, here we will need to add uint indexed uh, I, uh, ID, okay, and this way we can pass uh, the ID and we can even, uh, again, filter events on a specific uh, value of ID. Okay, last thing we want to do is to add, actually there are a couple of more things, uh, is to add a function to uh, return the number of talks. Okay, so get number of talks is a public constant function that returns an unsigned integer, simply returns the value of total talks. By the way, this could have been replaced by simply declaring the state variable itself here as public. If you do that, then the compiler will generate a getter for this variable. Just a getter, no setter. There is no way to modify a contract uh, state variable 
uh, in a generated function of any kind and only in your functions that you define yourself. Okay. Uh, in this case, I will just use my uh, my function here because I want to change its name. Otherwise, it has the same name as the so it will be called total talks. Um, and that's it. Now, I, of course, I have to change the implementation of get talk. Okay, because it those variables that it returns don't exist anymore. And here. Again, we are limited by what we can do or not do with Solidity. Uh, we cannot return an array of structured types because, again, that's because the EVM doesn't have any knowledge of structured types. Uh, this is something that will change soon, normally. Uh, in the next version of Solidity, there should be some, uh, some changes to that. Uh, but yeah, for now, it's not possible. Um, and so, yeah, again, uh, this function just talk, it just takes uh, the talk ID as an input parameter and it returns all the values. So we cannot return a structured type itself. So we cannot return talk here. Uh, we have to return the unpackaged version of it. Okay, so we check that this talk ID corresponds to a talk. We could have done the same with just uh, checking that talk ID is less or equal than uh, talk, total talks, for example. Uh, we check that the talk has not been cancelled, uh, and then we can load uh, this talk. So within Solidity, we can use, uh, uh, I mean, inside a function, we can use structured types however we want. So we just load it. Uh, and this memory thing is, again, very important. So by default, when you load something from the contract state, you actually load a reference to the contract state. Okay. And uh, it's different than if you want to modify it in memory. And here, we just want to return it from memory. Okay, We don't want to take any chance that we'll modify the state. So we just load the, the, the variable from the contract state into memory. And then all the subsequent operations on talk will be a little cheaper because we're manipulating memory instead of, contracts, uh, instead of blockchain uh, persistence, if you want. Uh, so here we're loading this in memory. We're doing the same for the speaker's address and speaker's name. And here we are actually assigning, uh, I mean, creating new arrays uh, with the right uh, size. And uh, we are iterating over uh, the talk speakers and assigning them to, copying them into our uh, uh, arrays that then we can return. Okay, so return, take talk title, location, start time, end time, and those two arrays that we've just built. Okay, so now that we have that, again, it's a constant function, does not modify the state, and we're good. The last thing that we want to do, I think it's the last. Yeah, so here we have a function to return the details of a talk. Now we need also a function to return a list of talks. Actually, what we will do, again, we cannot return, uh, I mean, a big array of anything of unknown size. So to avoid that, what we will do is uh, return an a list of IDs. And then the front end can iterate over those, those IDs and retrieve the details for each, um, for each talk. You might think, okay, that's clearly suboptimal. We are dealing with an n plus one situation here. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that you want to avoid on a database. And you would be right. But here, again, this is a constant function. It's just querying state directly from a local node. Okay, so the cost is not that big. And uh, yeah, and in that case, we, we don't have a choice. We have to do that. So let's add this get talks. Uh, function. So here we added a little bit of uh, funky stuff to it uh, to filter if we only want the event, the talks that have been cancelled or not. Uh, so if you pass it false, you will get all the talks uh, that have not been cancelled. Sorry, and uh, and it returns an array of unsigned integers that corresponds to talk IDs. Okay. Of course, this function call will only be valid if we have some talks. And then we'll build uh, an array of all talk IDs 
that will be initialized as an array containing total talks element. Unfortunately, from within uh, a solidity function, uh, especially when you're dealing with an in-memory in array, you have to specify the size. Again, kind of cumbersome at, at the beginning, but uh, that's the thing that you have to do. So that means that we will store some talk IDs because we have to filter them uh, according to their cancelled state. And if we have some cancelled talks and we only wanted the non-cancelled talks, then the resulting array will be smaller than the total number of, uh, of talks. So we'll need to do a little bit of uh, algorithmic magic to shrink uh, the table after that. Uh, so again, we check uh, the status of the talks. Depending on the value we get passed, we add, we copy uh, the talk IDs in our uh, array. If number of talks is equal to total talks, it means that no talks was canceled and the array size is the same, so we can just return it directly. Otherwise, we create a new array, a smaller one, containing just a number of talks that have not been canceled, and then we copy over. Very low-level stuff, very weird stuff to do when you're used to more uh, expressive languages, but still. Okay. And that's it. So we could also add some functions to, uh, uh, for example, return the, uh, the, the only the talks of a given speaker and so on. But again, that's uh, basically the same logic uh, over again, so it doesn't bring anything new to the table. Uh, now that we have that, let's run truffle migrate. Oh, for him, nothing has changed, of course, because the migration state uh, said that we already run all the migration scripts. So we have to run truffle migrate dash dash reset to force the latest version of our contracts to be deployed. And it's working. And now we can run truffle console. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do it. That so that you can see better. Okay, so here the same as before deployed. We get an instance of our deployed contract and we save it in a local variable. Tick, tick, voilà. So app contains our contract. And then we will add a new, uh, we'll watch the add talk event to make sure that the, the event is triggered correctly. So var add talk event equals app dot add talk event dot watch. I will fill that in now. So here I'm not going to filter on values. And I'm just going to go from block latest to block latest. Okay. And then in watch, I get a function. And this function has an error and an event. And I simply console log the event. Unexpected string. Of course, I made a mistake. Oh, yeah. Two block. Yeah. Two block. I forgot the colon. There we go. Okay, now let's do a start time again. New date. Get time, oops. Okay, and we'll do the same for end time. It will just be easier to use later on. Okay. And now we can add a talk. Add, well, actually, before I add a talk, Let's Define just speakers. 
ये टॉक्स Yeah. I have to define a parameter. Oh no, that's not what I wanted to do. Get the number, uh, of, get the number of talks. Yeah. So if I call this constant function to get the total number of talks, I get zero. Okay. And now I can add a talk. So I can call the add talk function just to remember that I need to specify some metadata after it. So this talk will be called talk one. It will happen in room four. Start at start time and at end time. And here we have to pass uh, an array of speaker addresses and an array of speaker names. You can do it directly here. Okay, so for the speaker addresses, let's say that it will be web3.eth.accounts one and web three dot eth dot accounts two for example okay and the name will be I don't know Said and Sebastian for example okay and now in the metadata of course we need to specify who is adding uh the talk and here I will use web3.eth.accounts1 and you human compilers will already know that there is a problem if I do that I get a VM exception and the VM exception in my case just returns invalid opcode because I'm using an old version of, of test RPC it should say uh, revert uh, triggered or whatever mm -hmm. Uh, but just to show you that here we have an exception and that's it. We don't know why, we don't know, no, mes no error message, no whatever. Just something wrong happened with your code. And of course, if I run now from account zero, which is really the account, the contract owner, then I get a transaction receipt with some logs and the log, uh, the event is logged to the console. So I can see that I have an ad talk event. It has an ID a name, and start time and end time. OK, so now if I run uh, app get number of talks again, yeah. everything works. And if we get talk one, we get the details for talk one. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we wanted to show you more, like uh, how to register, uh, I mean, how to reward um, um, speakers and also the front end, but we won't have time. <laughs> it's already 10 minutes left. Uh, so, uh, one thing that is important right now, you saw that with the register uh, function, we added some con we added some value, some ether to the contract balance, and then of course the contract balance will be able to transfer that value to other accounts, whether uh, other contracts or other users, and in our case it will be speakers. So you can use that logic to actually uh, pay the speakers with actual ether, and that's where the power of uh, smart contracts is. They, ha they have, they contain value, they can send value, they can receive value. Okay, so that's something that you will be able to see uh, in the GitHub rep repository. And uh, also for the front end, we just wanted to show you, it's very simple, but uh, you can uh, develop any kind of JavaScript framework that connects using the same Web3 uh, function, uh, uh, functions that we as we are using in the Truffle uh, test. So the logic remains the same. Uh, you just have to take into account that a lot of the actions are uh, asynchronous, so never take something into uh, account directly, and you always have to yeah, show the user that something is happening in, in the background. Okay, I, I will just show the, the transfer mode. So here, quickly, if a, a speaker wants to be rewarded, so he will call the withdraw reward, and here he will have some logic that will count the, your rewards, 
And what is really important here is this line, because this line will transfer uh, um, a number of, of uh, money, of ethers, to the speaker. So here, the logic is the speaker, that is the message sender, will receive the number of, of rewards regarding the, the, the toll that, uh, that uh, he has given uh, during the conference. And if the transfer failed, everything that has been changed here will be uh, reverted. So your contract instances will not be changed if the transfer failed. And that we, we trigger an event with a reward event. That's it. Okay, so just to, that was just to show you that you can transfer value out of a contract. And then let me just show you quickly three. Uh, so that is the, the code uh, of the front end. So again, when you unbox the pet shop example, you get a full uh, jQuery application at first, and, uh, and you can customize it. And here, for example, in app.js, which is the JavaScript uh, of our application, uh, for example, the function that reloads the talks and displays them uh, can access the contract in the same way as we did in the Truffle console and in the tests. Uh, so using the deployed function, we get an instance we call the get talks function with false saying we want only the talks that have not been canceled. We get a, a list of talk IDs. And then we can uh, simply, well, using jQuery, we re reinitialize our state. Um, and uh, we can iterate over those IDs. And for each one, call the get talk function again. And in the return, we call display talk, which is in this case is simply a JavaScript function that will update. Uh, individual element of our list of talks. Okay, all of that will run in a traditional browser, provided that you use something called MetaMask. So, uh, MetaMask is a Chrome and Firefox, I think, extension, yeah. the uh, plugin that you can install in your browser, and that will actually act as a proxy to the real blockchain. Okay, so it will hold all your accounts, and uh, actually, I can show you here. Uh, the terminal is here, test RPC is here. Let me force an upgrade. Truffle migrate dash dash reset. So I'm redeploying my contracts. And uh, once it is done, I can run uh, the light serve uh, HTTP server provided by the contract. So npm run dev. npm install. Oh, shit. So I have to install dependencies first, of course. Um, and uh, this is just to illustrate that you can store uh, your uh, HTML, JavaScript, CSS files anywhere you want. Uh, of course, the easiest way to, is to store them on a central server. But then again, centralization and stuff. Um, and unfortunately, uh, there is no easy option to do it in a decentralized way for now. There is something called IPFS allows you to store your files in a decentralized way. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's kind of cumbersome to use. And soon there will be Swarm. That's an official project from Ethereum that will make that uh, very easy. But it's not ready yet. Uh, for now, let's run npm run dev. We serve our files from our local uh, server. And here you see it loads in the browser uh, quite uh, normally. And I will use MetaMask. So this is the extension where I can uh, connect to any number of network. And there is a, the notion of a vault that is a, a safe where it keeps all my uh, accounts and all my keys. And here I can switch to my local network. And I can, well, I can use this extension to view my accounts, to send transactions. And when I try to send a transaction from a, from a page, uh, MetaMask will intercept that call and will say, okay, this account is locked. Are you sure you want to confirm the transaction? And if so, I will sign it. If not, we stop it there. Okay. So this is an extension that's very powerful. There's also the Mist browser where you can do the same sort of things, but it's not very practical for development purposes. So that's MetaMask and the front end. Again, everything is available in the chain skill slash DevOps uh, repository on GitHub. So you will be able to check that code, run it yourself. There's a readme explaining everything. Uh, just a few last things to conclude. Uh, 
So overall, what's important to remember is that none of that code that we showed you was production ready. Uh, especially with all the jQuery stuff, it's not really uh, readable and maintainable in the end. And again, you can use React, that's the most used option right now, uh, to do that sort of things. Angular as well, Vue.js as well. So we created a DApp project with a Scratch, uh, uh, from scratch with uh, using Truffle, we created a smart contract with a few ad advanced data types like mappings and structured types. Uh, our contract can receive and send cryptocurrency, and it can also authorize access to certain methods depending on who is connected. And we almost showed you a basic way to connect a front end to our contract. Almost. Almost. A small, uh, very small uh, report. Uh, there was the DEF CON 3 uh, developer conference just last week in Cancun. Actually, I landed uh, yesterday. And uh, we were there to kind of follow the last news. Uh, so a few uh, last news from the network. Uh, the community is growing really fast. Uh, I think this year was like five times last year in terms of number of attendees. So it's growing really, really fast. Uh, Vitalik Buterin is kind of the inventor of Ethereum, if you want, is the creator of the initial project. And he proposed a very interesting uh, roadmap strategy that I really encourage you to, uh, to have a look at. Uh, there was a very few interesting tools uh, a very yeah some some very interesting tools that we discovered and we're going to cover them uh, on the blog and uh, the general impression from the whole community is that we are still playing with toys that are really early pre-production stuff so it's going to come production ready soon but we're still dealing with uh, some scalability and uh, and productivity issues Another important message from the conference, everybody, all the developers from the core team said, okay, stop this ICO madness. You're spending, you're wasting way too much time on that. We need more uh, brain time on the tools and on the, the, the infrastructure itself regarding the remark above. And yeah, Mexico. Okay. <laughs> uh, so that's it. The last thing we wanted to say, again, we have this uh, online course. I think I might have mentioned it couple of times. 100 times. Uh, it's on Udemy, and if you use DevOps 2017 code, you get the whole course for 15 euros, and that's valid also for the people who are watching us on YouTube live right now. And we demonstrate how to create a front-end application. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we have time. We have 10 hours. Yeah, we so. have time, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.